passages around. Okay. Okay. So good evening, everyone. Thank you, Shlomo, for this uh, very kind introduction. Uh, I would like to, to convey three messages this evening, and I hope I will succeed. The first, the title of the presentation is Peace in the Holy Land, It Can Be Done. And I want to convince you that not only that it can be done, it is very easy to do. The second thing is that uh, I would like to convince you that interface dialogue is the best way to do it. And the third, maybe in a small thing in the, in the end, I will also mention how you can be part of it. Uh, so let's start with the first. Uh, the metaphor that I have, and soon I will be using another metaphor, the metaphor that I have is that entering this hall is very easy if you walk through the door. But if you try to, walk, to come in through, the, through the, uh, the wall, it will be very, very difficult. And I think that uh, um, most of the efforts that are done are as if we try to enter the room through, through the wall. Most people would tell you that it, they know very well how the solution will look like. And they say the problem is that it's very difficult to get there because the, we need the will of the people and this does not exist. I say that it's the opposite. I say I have no idea how the political arrangement will look like in the end. I know, but I, I do know the way to get there. The, in this metaphor, the, the door is not so short as it is here. I think it's a long process, but it's a process that, that is easy to perform. And let me explain to you what I mean. Imagine a couple that have problems in their marriage. But they are a Catholic couple, they, they cannot divorce. So people uh, recommend to them to, to separate. So they negotiate to separate. They divide their flat, one bedroom for him, one bedroom for her. They divide the, the living room. They put a, a barrier on the divide line. They divide the times of use of the bathroom, of the, of the kitchen, and so on and so forth. So, of course, the negotiation will be very, very dif difficult, right? I mean, the, the, the issues of who will get which room and who will use the kitchen in what time are extremely difficult issues to solve. Uh, of course, anyone from the side will say it's very easy. This, this one uses it now, this one uses it later, and everything is fine. But even let's take a step forward and imagine that they reach a solution. They reach an agreement and they try to implement it. I, I will not take the vote, but I think that anyone who has been married even once knows that it will never work. Uh, now let's go to the Holy Land, and I think the metaphor is very relevant. Uh, the whole size of the Holy Land is 100 kilometers. The distance between the Mediterranean Sea and the Jordan River is never more than 100 kilometers. Any Israeli and any Palestinian are never more than a few tens of kilometers from each other. Many times there are, there are a few meters from each other. So in this situation, to think that we can separate the two, the two communities into uh, two separate states that uh, doesn't matter how they, they will refer to each other. They, will, can, they can be friendly, they can be hostile, doesn't matter as long as there are two states, I think is not very sensible. Yes, it, it could have, separation could have been a solution in this situation uh, if one community would go to Alaska and the other community would go to Russia somewhere. And then, then if they are far away enough, then I don't care about the relationships. But since they are continuing to live together in a very small piece of land, which is, let's say, I, I was once in Istanbul, someone told me that the size of Istanbul is 200 kilometers. That's twice the, the size of, uh, of the Holy Land. So imagine someone would suggest to cut Istanbul into two and put each in a different country and they will not, and not bother about the relations between them. It's crazy. So the, the key is not, is not the number of states that will be there between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean Sea, but the quality of the relations that these communities will have with each other. I, I think that this is the root cause of the conflict. 
not the issues, not uh, the, the borders and the water and the settlements and Jerusalem and the refugees and everything else. Everything else are results of the broken relationship of these two communities who live side by side, who used to live in harmony and now do not live in harmony and have to back, uh, go and live in harmony in order to, to solve all these issues. So why uh, the relations are broken? So I don't know why they were broken in the past. Uh, probably uh, it's a very interesting question, but I don't think it's relevant for discussion today. What I do know is why they continue to be broken and I think how to, to be able to mend them. Um, uh, I th since, since we, as I said, we live in a very small piece of land, uh, we should have uh, worked on these relations even if the relations were bad because we know each other so well and we know all the negative qualities of the other and we know why this other is impossible to live with but still we should have learned to live with them. But the good news are that the two communities are extremely segregated. They know very little about each other. But because we always maintain full image of the other, we fill the gaps with prejudices, with stereotypes, with something we held here, with something we picked up there. And uh, the end result is that, that we have a very negative image of the other uh, that has very little to do with reality. And uh, even the, this, the little bits and pieces that we do get uh, from the reality are interpreted in light of these prejudices and therefore are again part of the whole picture that is negative. Uh, the problem with that is that it's, it is not something that we learned in an organized way. Usually it is not something that you read on the textbook and it says, you know, the other is like this or like that. It's, these are things that we picked up and internalized and are part of our psychology. So in order to counter that, it is not enough to go to places and give lectures and presentations and provide statistical information that will uh, convince everyone that the other is human and are nice people and you can work with them and all of that because uh, all of these touch only the cognitive level. And if we hear a very learned lecture and, uh, uh, about all of this, we will nod our heads, we will be convinced logically, but we will continue to hold our prejudices because the prejudices are rooted psychologically and in order to uproot them, we need a strong experience. And ex this strong experience can come from encountering the other. If you meet the other face to face for a deep and positive and meaningful encounter, you immediately uh, discover the, uh, that they are human like you, that, that you have uh, uh, the way to talk with them and so on. Let me tell you a story about uh, that repeated itself 12 times. I think at least half of them you were there. Between 2002 and 2005, so I mean the times when the Intifada was very much active, we had a series of 12 Israeli-Palestinian retreats. The Israelis were people coming from Jerusalem and Tel Aviv mainly, escaping exploding buses, uh, people who have in many times they've never met Palestinians before, and at that time what they knew they came from the media and at that time that meant that the Palestinians are always struggling to kill them. Especially that these Palestinians were young adults coming from Nablus, which is the cities that produced the highest number of suicide bombers, and fitting very much themselves the profile of the suicide bomb bomber, young people unmarried and so on. On the other hand, there was a group of young Palestinians coming from uh, Nablus, escaping uh, tanks and ambushes and I don't know what, get a, a going on the way at 4 a.m. in the morning to travel for 12 or 13 hours, this one hour ride, always arriving, uh, and also have never met Israelis before. So what they knew came from their media, which means that the Israelis are always trying to kill them. And this, so I, I think that opening conditions were not great. Um, and you could see, in the, we used to meet uh, on Thursday afternoon, you could see the opening session, two very well distinct uh, groups sitting separately. Then we went to the first dinner, separate tables. But then you could see physically during the, 
they retreat, how they mix more and more, they stay, they take any opportunity to meet each other, they um, uh, st uh, use the, the, uh, the breaks and the meals and stay late at night to have more and more conversations. And after 24 hours, uh, on Friday night, we used to have a, a social evening that took different forms, but after 24 hours only, you could see them singing together, dancing together, telling jokes with each other. And then when time came on Saturday to, to farewell, it was always with hugs and tears. And even myself as an organizer in the beginning, uh, I was always anxious, will it work, will it not work? The, fir the first time while we, we were there, there, were, uh, uh, there was an invasion of the Israeli army into Nablus and uh, there was a whole uh, excitement and we needed the mayor of Nablus to speak with them and tell them that they should stay and so on. But I found myself after five or six or seven of them relaxed before it because I knew it will work, I knew it will work well. So this is uh, maybe an illustration uh, to how effective the interface encounter approach is, and I will describe it in a minute. Um, but I think more than that, I think that uh, if you can achieve this transformation in only 24 hours with the best of approaches, that means that the conflict itself is much less deep than, than it looks. Now, what is the interface encounter approach and how it has to do with what I uh, spoke about until now? Um, I, I said that we, in order to counter the prejudices, we need a strong experience. And I said, I think, I think I'm right, that the, the, the only way to do it is by bringing the people together. You can tell, um, if someone has an image of someone who is diabolic, you can tell them they are human as much as you like, but the image will stay. Once they meet face to face, they, they not only forget the image, but sometimes they even forget they, that they had it. Uh, but if you just bring them together and say nothing, the, after 10 minutes, they will be fighting about politics, which is not the best way to connect them. Um, at least in our part of the world, the political discourse is extremely superficial and extremely divisive. So it's not something that you can really have a decent conversation about. So we say we will not discuss any political issues. We do not have, as an organization, political views. We welcome people from all parts of the political spectrum, and we get people from all parts of the political spectrum, or at least, at least nearly all parts. Uh, we say instead of talking about, about politics, which is the default, let's talk about, uh, about religion. Uh, not necessarily religion in the sense of, uh, uh, of people who, who are very much connected or very much uh, observant, because many of the people who participate are, are secular in their own uh, understanding, but everyone is connected to a certain religious tradition, and this connection is good enough. And more than that, uh, talking about these issues from this perspective takes the conversation to a much deeper level. People share things that have deep existential value for them, and therefore the, the whole encounter becomes much more intimate than just exchange of ideas. Another advantage of this type of dialogue, which, which is the, probably the most obvious, people discover many similarities between, between the different traditions. And for new people, this comes as a real revelation. They would say, wow, we never knew that do, you had this concept. We never knew that do it, you had that concept. Uh, and, and I think part of the success of this approach is, is that it does bring many, many new people and many, many new types of people that are not parts of other types of dialogues. The third advantage, which is maybe even more important, is the fact that in this, in this way we are able to discuss differences in a way that not only does not threaten the conversation, but help construct it and the relations that are built by it. Uh, because when people come to interfaith uh, exchange, uh, they some, some will expect to hear different views, otherwise why this one religion have three different names? So uh, they are open for that and uh, the conversation allows for diversity, for disagreement, and through that people train themselves to develop friendships with people that they disagree with, which is the real challenge that we face. We, we started the, the organization 12 years ago. We At that time we did not have a concept of what, we are, what is now the main activity that we do, which are ongoing groups that bring together 
neighboring communities. At that time, we thought about the first encounter, which is the, the time where someone gets rid of most of their prejudices. But very quickly, we discovered that uh, there's a lot of value in developing relations over time. And now, most of our activity uh, is done in the framework of these groups. Uh, the groups bring together neighboring communities. Neighboring communities usually mean people who live uh, not far from each other, but many times it means people who, uh, people who share an interest or a vocation or something, or language skills. I mean, the group that Shlomo runs is a group of educators that are all Jerusalemites, but uh, they could have come also from out of Jerusalem if they wanted to have this type of dialogue. We had a group focused on prayer issues. We have a group of uh, midwives, and this, I think, is the most spread out group because one of the coordinators live right at the Lebanese border, and I think the most southern is at least in Hebron, maybe even south of Hebron. So the idea is to allow people who want to develop this relationship a, a simple model that will allow them to, to do so. Um, so the, the, the most basic uh, function of the groups is to provide an opportunity for encounter, because as I said, the communities are very segregated, and if I grew up in a Jewish community and I want to have dialogue with Muslims, I don't know how to do it, that I will not just walk into a Muslim neighborhood and knock on doors and ask who wants to, to have dialogue with me. Most of the people will not do that. But if there is a group, uh, an encounter group in the, in the area, then I have a, a time and place that I can just come and join. The second uh, function is to develop the group itself into some kind of mini community that combines good understanding of each other, uh, respect to, each, to the unique identity of each, and friendship. Most people will say that it's impossible to create it, but once we have something that is active and is working, uh, it's definitely possible. So it is uh, both given the example of how things should be and, and uh, proving that it is possible. The third function is to act as a mechanism that gradually changes the overall pattern of intercommunal relations between the larger communities. Because when we start a group, it's, from our perspective, it's forever. And I think Shlomo, I think you are younger than what you are because I think your group is active maybe seven or eight years already. It's time, time is running. Time is running too fast. Most people do not stay there forever. Uh, some do, but not all. Some people, after two or three or four years, they will leave and they will do something else, but they live very different in terms of attitude towards the other than the way they came. So once we get enough people who went through the process of the groups, then we will see a whole different relationship between the communities as a whole. Till now we established 51 groups. Uh, it's not only the number, but also there's diversity in types of groups. Uh, we have, we present the group of educators, we have a group of midwi midwives, as I mentioned, we have groups for women, groups for young adults, groups for university students in campuses, outside campuses, a group uh, or two for young children, and so on and so forth. The vision is to establish uh, many more groups, to establish hundreds and maybe thousands of groups of, with many types, with the, the slogan that we use is that we want that each person will have a, a group that is both close to his home and close to his heart. We have, among those uh, groups, we have 14 groups that bring together uh, Israelis and West Bank Palestinians, and among them we have the six maybe only groups in the, in the country that bring together settlers and Palestinians. Uh, these include three groups of uh, yeshiva students uh, who meet young Palestinians who live nearby, uh, and a group of, uh, uh, of rabbis that meet uh, rabbis mostly from Gush Etzion, which is a settlement area south of Jerusalem, who meet uh, Salafi sheikhs from uh, Hebron. Maybe one sentence about how you could join. So, I mean, first, you're welcome, if you took this brochure, you're welcome to visit our website. I, I will present maybe one or two videos, but there are more videos there. There is here this, this box that tells you how to join the listserv. And if you do, you will get twice a week updates from the different activities. Uh, again, on the website, there's a whole Get Involved page, uh, which will say that you are, you, there are different ways to be involved. But maybe I, I want to stress here one way, which is 
I would call it parallel dialogue that is connected with us because if you care for the Middle East and if you have dialogue in your own place of other people who care for the Middle East and it is similar interfaith dialogue connected with what we do in the Holy Land, then it is part of the, of the process that we are trying to promote. Unfortunately, it's easier to understand, I think, this argument from the negative perspective because everyone understands that if there are clashes between Israelis and Palestinians, it induces tensions between Jews and Muslims and sometimes Christians and Muslims. But, you know, if according to the third law of Newton, if this interaction exists, also this interaction exists. So, in the same way, dialogue responses to the situation in other places is part of the same process of dialogue that we try to promote in the Holy Land. I think at least 10% of the people should meet each other, so that we talk about a million people that will meet each other. Yeah. It's doable. We, we, we just need an effort to do it, a concentrated effort to do that. Okay.